It's Dr. Drew, Midday Live, with Leanne Tweeden. And you can get it right now. Midday Live, Leanne Tweeden, Dr. Drew. Let's speak with former Special Agent, Drug Enforcement Agent, Derek S. Maltz. Uh, on the DEA role in the opioid crisis, but right now it is former Special Agent, Derek S. Maltz. You can follow Derek on uh, Derek Maltz, M-A-L-T-Z, underscore S-R. Derek, welcome to the program. Welcome back. Hello, Dr. Drew and Leanne. How you guys doing? Good, we are you. good. So tell us the, about the DEA and its role in uh, the opioid crisis. Well, DEA uh, is an agency that I worked for for 28 years. Fortunately, I ran the Special Operations Division and had some visibility on all their operations around the globe. But specifically as it, it relates to the opioid crisis, I watched this evolution for years, starting with pills and white heroin, and then now fentanyl that's killing people all around the country. At last year's statistics, 32,000 died. But in the opioid crisis, I mean, obviously there's a lot of reports out there. Uh, the inspector general concluded some some facts from his investigation on DEA, DEA specifically. But from my standpoint, this is a very complex public health challenge. And for them to highlight DEA's shortcomings and for them to cite how DEA was slow, I would adamantly disagree. I mean, DEA is known to be a super aggressive law enforcement agency. In my opinion, it's one of the best law enforcement agencies. There's a lot of factors in, in play here, considering the politics and the big pharma and the influence that people had on the Department of Justice and the lack of aggressive prosecutions. I mean, this isn't anything new. You know, one thing that pisses me off, excuse me, but I get very passionate with this. It's not a surprise. Anyone in law enforcement will tell you that most of the United States attorney's offices out there are not super aggressive. And, and certainly back in those days, it wasn't popular to prosecute and go after these corporate criminals that were dumping poison all throughout our, our country. And specifically, you know, getting our people addicted to these opioids for years and no one actually wanted to do anything about it you know right i i i i gotta tell you i was um fighting it from the beginning it was perpetrated by my profession make no mistake about it with the duplicitous uh handmaiden the pharmaceutical agents and it it was funny when the current administration decided to do something about it i heard it was jeff sessions that really mm -hmm the Department of Justice, who really took it on. So he's the one. I heard him. I was he in the it. room when he said, we're, we're going to get this. I'm going to take care of these overprescribers. It's time that they be held accountable. And that was the end of it. Right. It, and then, of course. But, what, I, but didn't they go after some of the pharmaceutical companies, too, oh, just yeah. recently? Also, yeah. yeah. But, also I mean, it, it wasn't oh, it yeah, still yeah. just like, you know, barely, a, you know, That's just a few dollars, really? For, mm, yeah. Billions. Well, yeah. Cases. But to them, well, though, isn't that still? No, they're going bankrupt. 500. $572 million, you know, uh, in Oklahoma, the Johnson & Johnson settlement, another $20 million this week in Ohio, the night before the, uh, the civil trials. And they're all coming in. They all want to pay fines. But what's needed, Dr. Drew and Leanne, is we need aggressive criminal prosecutions. If you look at the famous case out in Denver, the Denver DEA was doing an incredible job on a specific distribution company. And they had all these egregious acts, all these violations. They brought it to the U.S. Attorney's Office, and nothing was done. And then mm -hmm. eventually they got fined. But DEA wasn't even in the loop about, you know, what the settlement should be. DEA was left in the, in the cold because there's a lot of influence. The lawmakers, the, the lobbyists, the congressional uh, people that are around the beltway, it's all about the money. It's not only following the bad guys' money in the criminal world. It's all about the money with the good guys, too. So, and so we have to, you know, we have to watch that. I mean, it's very misleading, in my opinion, the way this report came out. Like, for example, my buddy was the whistleblower on 60 Minutes. He ran the DEA diversion program for 10 years. He was interviewed by the inspector general for quite some time. And you didn't read any of his statements, right? Because right. that wouldn't have been popular. Just like when I was interviewed on the Boston bombing case, for many hours, my stuff was put in a classified report, but nothing I told them was classified. Mm. They didn't want the public to know the truth about what really went wrong in the Boston bombing. And they don't want to know. They don't want the public to know how prosecutors were not prosecuting uh, serious corporate criminals. Instead, they wanted to just fine them and, you know, get them to come in and talk and 
They put more roadblocks, more obstacles in front of the agents. It was like every day a new requirement seemed to pop up on these hardworking agents. So it's very misleading. It's very discouraging. And now the big issue I have is the fact that people now are dying from fentanyl. And we're now going back because Jeff Sessions cleaned up the mess with President Trump. We're going back now where these people should have been dealt with 15 years ago. Instead, now the Mexican cartels and the Chinese organized crime are dumping the fentanyl poison, which Mm. is really responsible for killing people now. So it's really disheartening in a lot of ways. A lot more deadly, right? But again, you've got to remember the, the, the mistake that, again, my profession made, which was when Jeff Sessions came on and cut everybody off, everyone got scared. They turned patients into bad people as opposed to calling them in and going, you know, we never intended this to happen, but you and I have created a second problem here. You have addiction. We have to get that treated. Instead, they were told they're bad patients. They're cut off. They've been abusing opiates. Scram. And that's right. how they ended exactly. on the streets. That's how they ended on the streets. Right. But, but Derek, can I get this exactly. straight? Are we saying, are you saying from the beginning, though, the reason why, like in Denver, that things aren't really being taken care of is because politicians are getting are they getting con campaign contributions are they getting kickbacks well, okay. to are, are politicians are they looking the other way because they're getting money from 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 these the makers of of you know the, these pills and stuff like that is that why they're not really they're only giving like, these minimal fines and but they're letting the drug market continue like it is and not really no, shutting no, no, them no, down the drug market is shut down the fines have been in the well, hundreds saying, and hundreds of billions well, no, of dollars. No, but, but right? he's saying, like in Denver, they're not really doing anything. No, they're not doing anything with okay. the IV drug problem. Well, what I'm saying is that, okay, this is a very complex situation, so right. it's not one answer. What I'm saying to you is that in early on, nobody really understood this crisis and how the addicted population was going to grow and grow and grow. And like Dr. Drew said, I knew. that's what caused them to go to the street. Right. Well, yeah. you knew because you're a doctor. Not everybody's as smart as the Dr. Drew. But so. I can tell you that the, the government people, they weren't looking at it as a big problem. We were dealing with heroin. We were dealing with, uh, you know, cocaine, methamphetamine. Mm-hmm. Those were the main threats. And then all of a sudden, we started seeing people drop all over the place. And now all of a sudden, people started becoming along. What I'm saying is it's no secret that industry and lobbyists and Congress are all kind of like engaged with each other in the beltway. I call it the land of the make-believe for a reason. Okay, this place is like something out of another planet. And and, and bottom line is I don't think, you know, I wouldn't want to say people were corrupt in that sense, but they were, were they were taking big money from these companies right. for their campaign contributions. Yes. So yeah, I guess that is corruption. Yes. Okay. So I mean, so yes, it's multifaceted, but there is their little piece to look the other way. Right. Okay. And, and when you look at but when then you that, look at the blame, yeah. I have a problem with them blaming these dedicated DEA people. When you look at the DOJ, the Congress, the big pharma, the doctors. The, all these other people, teachers were uneducated because ONDCP was dropping the ball, not doing their job because President Obama really wasn't paying attention to the drug crisis because he was bragging about smoking marijuana. All right. So that's fine. But it was a different marijuana back in those days. My issue was this is a very complex problem. And you see now when people are taking it serious. It's starting to, you know, come together a little bit. But unfortunately, the population's already addicted, and now they're using the street drugs, and now they're dying all over the place. So we have a sense of urgency. Right. And it's almost too late. You know, I asked you, Dr. Drew, I'm like, now we have this entire generation. I mean, young, old, we see it all on the street. Now I'm like, what do we do now that we have all these addicts? I'm like, do we just, you know, do you wait for them to just sort of... This is what I'm waking working in the the Mm. White House with, which is that... Yeah, it's a very difficult problem. Uh, the The federal government has been overwhelmingly involved with what's called uh, medication-assisted treatment. It will not take care of this problem. Uh, you right, need so basically they'll just people. be on drugs the rest of their life? Well, that would be okay. Or they that die work. off or they, uh, Well, know. the die off is what you were kind of asking right, right. me. Kind of, I'm like, do they just die off because they will finally kill themselves with ODing? Or well, what? the last time we, the physicians caused the opiate crisis of the early 20th century, that was the consensus. We have no right. way to treat this. We just got to make sure it doesn't happen again. Mm. Now we have ways to treat it. We're just not doing it. And so that's really problematic for me. So. Yeah, I mean, again, like, you know, when people say that, okay, why did DEA, uh, 
you know, increase the quotas. But what people aren't realizing, and I, I'm no expert on this, Dr. Drew, but like the, the DEA uh, head of diversion was following the law. He was following the way the guidelines were written by Congress. So if, if the guidelines were written incorrectly or to favor industry, that's what the DEA was doing. Like they tried to get things changed. But, you know, Dr. Drew, I don't know if I told you this last week, but you know what's really sad? When I was at DEA for 10 years in the senior executive status, the guy who was heading diversion was probably the hardest working DEA executive that I saw at that time. And you know what happened to him at the end of his career? He wound up getting two frivolous OIG investigations on him, and he wound up getting tossed out of his job, and he wound up having health issues because of this problem. And all the guy was trying to do was save lives. But he was fighting everybody in the Beltway because the power of the dollar in this country is really sickening at times. And that's what I witnessed firsthand for a long period of time. When I went to Eric Calder's, when my people went to Eric Calder and briefed them in 2014 on the fentanyl crisis that was creeping up on us, not only did they not deal with the problem, they then lied to the Washington Post and the Department of Justice and told them that they were never warned about this crisis coming. <laughs> the, name, the name of our briefing was fentanyl, opioid, uh, synthetic fentanyl and heroin. That was the name of the briefing. We were showing them how many people were dying from this stuff back in 2013 in the Northeast of the United States. And it was something new to us, but then not only do they just sit there and not take any le leadership action, but then they try to tell the Washington post, they didn't, they didn't know anything about it. Oh, that's gotta make they you so to, angry. Well, I, yeah, I'm sure that I'm sure there's nothing unusual about that in politics. No, I'm I know, sure but, but for somebody like no, him, that that's his true. job. And then you brief the government and because that's what you're supposed to do. And then they lie right. to the press about it. But, but, but Dr. Mm. Drew, I, I understand what you're saying, but this is a little different because of the amount of people that were dying. So it's uh, a little oh. different. I mean, I can understand. We, we all make mistakes. Hey, you know what I'm saying? You know what? Like, I'm not, I mean, that's like you Derek, as a physician, Derek, Drew. Yeah, you know? Derek, there are three people dying on the streets of Los Angeles yeah. every day, and it's driving me insane. And yeah. guess what people are doing about it in the city and the state? Zero. Exactly nothing. Mm -hmm. And they just want to sit around yeah. and talk about building walls, and Derek, building houses. Where, where does yeah. most of the fentanyl come from? Does it come from China? Where's most Through of Mexico. it? Oh, Mexico. Oh, Mexico. Well, okay, Mexico, it depends Mexico. who you talk to. Like, it depends who you talk to. The Mexican cartels are the threat, but there is some very high pure uh, fentanyl coming in the mail from China. My understanding, talking to my buddies, is that there has been a increased effort in China, but I don't necessarily believe all that stuff. But I know the cartels are ramping up production, ramping up their labs and ramping up distribution because it's a big money maker and, it, and they're making billions of dollars from these products, not just fentanyl, like we talked about last week. Methamphetamine is rampant throughout the country and it's probably the worst problem we have in the country. Yeah. It's not killing as many people. And so right. we've, well, yeah, and we've yeah. just been talking about it. This is like internally within the United States, what we're talking about, but you know, we touched on this last week as well. Not only we have this problem, but not only that, we have the problem of the dirty money that goes out, that goes to terrorism, that goes to other countries where not only do the drug cartels or, you know, even terrorists from other countries can come in, not only destroy us from the inside, from addiction and all of this and destroy our, you know, breakdowns of society, but then take the money out and the billions of dollars that we're spending on their drugs, right? And then use it to destroy exactly. us out outwardly with the billions of dollars. That, that get sent back out to help fund whatever it is that they, you know, how they want right. to destroy us from the outside with terrorism or, or, you know, the drug trade. Well, we call that a jihad against America, and we also call it a two-for-one special. They can make millions and millions of dollars, billions of dollars from selling poison to our country, and we have the demand, people are using it, and they're dropping all over the place. So, yeah, the terrorists and the bad actors around the world, they love that concept because it's a win-win for them. I think Derek is the one, Leanne, that alerted us to this little, yeah. little arrangement. Yeah. So, okay, well, Derek. Can you do me a favor? Yeah. Go look at the doc. Go look at the document that I sent to one of your staffers. Yeah. Uh, I have it. I'll send it about. to you. Okay. And take a look at that, and you'll really understand why I'm, I'm passionate about that topic. What's, what's in there? What's in the document? Well, you'll see the millions of dollars flowing from businesses in America into Yemen, and you'll see the characters that are involved with this business, and you'll see how it's just like little crime centers in these convenience stores and these bodegas and these gas stations. But in America, we don't want to deal with it because they're from the Middle East. And God forbid 
we call it what it is, and that would be like very discriminatory picking on these poor families from the Middle East. But in fact, no one could really describe or explain why multi millions of dollars are going through our banks into these countries that really don't love us. Can we just go after the banks the then? Document. Can we go after the banks then if we don't want to go after the so called families? Well, the banks. I can tell you right now, I know firsthand, like in this case that I'm talking about, in in many of these cases, the banks did their obligation by filing suspicious activities to the government. Unfortunately, the government agencies did not adequately follow the money, Mm. and that's still a problem to this day. So we don't want to be picking on the banks on this one, Leanne, because they did, as far as I know, file a lot of cash transaction reports. Mm. They just were not properly followed up. Derek, we thank you as always. We will look for you yes. at uh, Derek Maltz underscore senior on Twitter. Anywhere else you'd like us to send people? No, that's fine. But, again, if I could help you guys, you guys are doing good work in L.A., and I'll help any way I can. Thank, thank you, you, Derek. Appreciate, appreciate you. very you. much. Our number is 800 When you get in the conversation, we'll be back in a moment with your calls.